740, it is the morning news. Dave Jackson and you, thanks for tuning in this morning. Um, got a hold of uh, Liz Halleck last Friday, exchanged a couple of emails, asked her if she could come on and uh, just give a little uh, uh, clarity into the legal matters involved in this Jason White thing. Um, obviously, it's a person from the district that's got to lead the charge uh, and get the petitions and all of that, but uh, she seems to be um, the one that's kind of helping to shed light on the, the legal arguments, and uh, she's kind of agreed to join us for a couple minutes this morning. Good morning, Liz. Thanks for Good being morning, here. Liz. Hi, Dave. It's great to hear your voice. Thanks, Liz. Hope you're healthy and uh, sheltering in place. Of course, uh, you know, true, true confessions, you have a very, <laughs> what everybody said was going to be a very burgeoning business, even in the time of coronavirus, right? The whole... Well... <laughs> Ironically, uh, you know, that was always part of my equation when I I started the business. You know, my my parents, I don't know how you were raised, but they, were, they always said, you know, always find something people need, find right. a skill people need during a depression. Well, you know, business is, uh, you know, revenue is definitely down because people aren't going out, and we've actually closed the interior of our facility. You can only come up to the foyer. So it's it's... And, and we brought other people on that were unemployed just so they could eat, you know, because they sure. can't get through to unemployment. So it's it's not rosy for everybody, for sure. But I definitely feel very grateful and fortunate right now. And I, and I have my family, which is the most important thing. So Absolutely. I'm here. You know, the Associated Press is saying that business in, in our stores around the state has business generally flattened or tapered off since it first began in March where you saw a big... A bunch of people, you know, buying. Is that is that the case? Panic here? buying. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they, yeah, panic buying. What we're trying to do, like any business, is just get enough revenue to make it through this and keep our employees fed. And that's the most important thing. And the most important thing is keeping them safe. So it's not like you can just reopen a business right now because there are so many new state and federal laws that require you to pay people when they are taking time off just to be tested for COVID. So it's not so simple as just, hey, let's just reopen our doors. There's a lot going on. Well, that's where your legal expertise, I'm sure, comes to to your advantage there, knowing the ins and outs of how the laws change. Let's redirect the laws to um, the the case of uh, Jason White. Uh, You know, I have read some of the stuff that he has said, Liz, and it it certainly Uh would seem to be... uh, contradictory to the, um, the collective expressed will of, uh, of the county, of the city, of the state, um, of the feds. He's out there uh, on his own. And uh, I know there's a, a, a protest planned uh, for uh, tomorrow night, but it, it's like this for everybody who screeches about free speech. And normally we're, we're among them. Uh, we also know you don't get to yell fire in a crowded theater. There, there are uh, prohibitions right. about what you get to do and what you don't. How, how, from a legalistic perspective, or at least what you feel is grounds enough to to be involved in this, um, wh- where's that yeah. line? What what can you say, and what uh, what constitutes violations that uh, the the assumption is that Mr. White has done? Yeah. Well, first of all, the background is, as you know, we're in this worldwide global pandemic that we haven't seen since, you know, our grandparents' time. You know, my grandmother, she was the only survivor in her first grade class from the 1918 flu. So this is a a once-in-a-century event. So uh, the background is our local health authority said, hey, we have an emergency here. And there's a statute where they can declare an emergency, penalize violators, and anyone who procures or aids and abets people violating their emergency order, right? So in that case, I mean, um, there are restrictions on speech when it could really hurt someone. And, you know, the statute that the um, health authority gets its power from was recently recodified in every single local Republican legislature, from Jim Honeyford down to Chris Corey, voted, yay, we want the health authority to have that local power to declare an emergency and keep right. people safe. Right. So, but this is, this is under, right. this recall is brought under the state constitution. It's not the government chilling Mr. White's speech. So you can be held accountable for the things that you say. 
and he's interfering with the health authority here. Because yeah, a lot of people on our Facebook page are saying he has his First Amendment rights to say what sure. he wants to say. But, but Sure, but as a public official, you take an oath, an oath of office, right? And, the, and, and we know that government employees can't interfere with the government's work, right? Um, and so, so there's, a, there, there's no definitive answer to this as to how much free speech a public official is allowed. We do know this. They're allowed 100% free speech under the speech and debate clause. But guess what? you got to show up to meetings. Right. <laughs> and that's the problem. He's not even doing his job. There's a dereliction of his oath of office. He's not doing his job duties and that all of that is cause for recall isn't that weird though that there is no clear-cut um yeah. lev- leverage yeah, or really. prohibition that you can use on somebody that doesn't show mm-hmm. it's like wait a second there's not a, a a rule in the grand scheme of things that says miss four meetings in a row and your, your failure to represent your district would result in your district having the right to find a new you i mean that's not even in there which is surprising to me you're right uh-huh. you got to be there to represent well, there are cases. I mean, there was a case in Black Diamond where, where uh, a city council person stopped coming to meetings. And it's not that that's illegal. So the, we as the voters aren't going to say that's illegal, but we're saying you're not fulfilling the duties that we elected you to do. And it's, and it's interesting because we're kind of working out the kinks of this district-wide system, right? So they have a District 2 representative, and their whole voice isn't being heard right, right. now because of this, this system. So, uh, yeah, it, 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 it's a huge dereliction of duty on his part. And as a private citizen, you know, he can say whatever he want, wants. But um, th- there's a distinction when you're a public official who's been elected to take care of your district. And, and we just need to find someone else who wants to do the job because it, it sounds like he doesn't want to do it anymore. Right. I mean, we always hear that, you know, you should be held to a higher standard. And, and that's always yeah. sort of um, uh, encouragement speak uh, without any teeth to that. But you're right, the district does have a right to seek a, a representative. The system is designed now for that, and if he's not going to be the guy, then it makes sense that the district would. Um, I guess there's no punishment other than to say, <laughs> we want just somebody new in your place. Is that what this thing ultimately seeks to bring about? Yeah, because we're in a public health emergency, and we don't really have time to play games right now. Um, and also, you know, this, this is our generation, my generation's chance here to show older generations we really care. And, and saying things like that uh, people are asymptomatic, aren't carriers of the disease, um, it's just not, he's not being helpful at all. And people can say, oh, you have free speech to say this, but, you know, the, the state legislators were pretty clear, you can't tell people to violate public health emergencies. That was a unanimous uh, vote that was just taken in March, and all the state legislators said, hey, you know, there are limits on your speech. Not all speech is protected in an emergency like this. Yeah, I so, think that's the key line. Go ahead, Lynn. Well, what's the, so how does this happen? How, what do you need to do to make this yeah, happen? Procedurally, what, yeah. what goes on? Oh, yeah. So it's a, it's a really clear-cut procedure. Um, first of all, we uh, filed uh, a request for a petition to recall. You have to um, state legal, legally and factually sufficient charges. Um, so there has to be dates, times, places, evidence. This happened, not just speculation. Um, you know, the... You can't, you can't uh, recall someone simply because you disagree, right? You have to show they're, they're doing something egregious. They're neglecting their oath of office. Um, and then you have 15 days for the county auditor to um, basically go over this complaint, say there's sufficient charges or not. The judge looks at it. And then, um, then it goes on uh, the ballot once you get enough signatures. One of the things we did request is to get... Uh, uh, signatures online, you know, so that we wouldn't be violating the state at home right, order right. ourselves. But but this, that's up to the auditor. So well, and it's counterproductive. I mean, if the if the whole premise is giving contradictory health information, and the system then requires you to contradict <laughs> health guidance to do what you need to do, that's not going to work so good, right? So um, no, no, I don't.
don't think it was um, anyone, the health authorities' intent in issuing the order or the governor's intent in issuing the order that any local councilman who disobeyed or encouraged um, defiance of the order shouldn't be recalled. So, but it's, it, it, we're saying that it's non-discretionary for um, Charles Ross to allow to collect electronic signatures, um, but he may or may not agree on that. But, you know, this is a small district, so we only need 200 or so signatures. And is that process underway, Liz? Do you know there's uh, the other folks that are involved? <laughs> no. No. Well, I mean, people are asking already, where do right. I sign? But first, there has to be a ballot synopsis, like here are the charges. The judge has to certify it. Um, if there's an appeal, that has to be done. But um, you can't sign anything until the auditor comes out and, and we get approved, um, uh, approved, ballots, uh, approved ballot synopsis, synopsis, approved petition for it. Gotcha. All right. Interesting. Um, well, uh, you've got other lawsuits out there, too, right? We may want to touch base with you down the road on some of those. Uh, but but this, one's, uh, this one's interesting. This is at the heart of our city council. This gentleman's involved in a, a number of other decisions and statements that uh, have raised eyebrows or what have you. So um, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. Uh, yeah, luck. I mean, a lot, of the, a lot of that other stuff is his free speech. But in this case, I think there's a line that was crossed. Yeah, that's the technical distinction. Good job, Liz. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Uh, have a good, productive, uh, positive Monday, and uh, yep. we'll talk to you down the road. Thanks so much.